Howdy, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about section 7.5, which is to use properties of trapezoids and kites. These are our last two four-sided quadrilateral shapes, and the reason that we've saved them for last is because they are not parallelograms. So everything else that we've done so far has been based off the idea of a parallelogram. These ones are not parallelograms. So uh, our first shape is the trapezoid, and you can see that right here. Um, for our trapezoid that we have right here, um, it is a quadrilateral, it has four sides, and it has exactly one pair of parallel sides. So that is very, very key. The most important word right there is exactly, which means you can't bump that up to two and it still have it be okay. It has to be one and that's it. So now the one that I've picked out for you right here is pretty non-traditional. And I did that on purpose because I want you to make sure that you're feeling flexible with your um, with your definition of trapezoid right there. So our parallel sides, a lot of times people assume that they need to be the top and the bottom, especially since those are called the bases, but that's not necessarily the case. On this one, it is the left and the right that are gonna be your parallel sides. And you can name them as bases. This one would be B1 and this one over here would be B2. The non-parallel sides are going to be the legs. So we have a leg up here at the top and a leg down here at the bottom. We don't usually spend a ton of time talking about the legs, but they are still important to know about. Okay, so now the second one is probably more stereotypical. If you did feel familiar with trapezoids before we came here today, then uh, this is probably the picture you had in your mind. And that's called not just a trapezoid, but an isosceles trapezoid. And it is going to be a trapezoid with congruent legs. So you do have your parallel sides, and then those non-parallel sides are the ones that are gonna be congruent. So we've got our parallel arrowheads here on the top and on the bottom, and then we've got our tick marks on the left and on the right. Okay, so that's our first of two shapes. Our second shape is the kite. And a kite is another four-sided quadrilateral, and it has two pairs of congruent sides, which is not unheard of. In parallelograms, we have that as well, but these are gonna be consecutive congruent sides. So once again, it is the wording here that is key. So if you take a look, um, we have, uh, these two sides right here are gonna be congruent to each other and they're right next to each other. They're not opposite sides like in a parallelogram. And these two sides are gonna be parallel to or uh, congruent to each other. And once again, they're not opposites, they're consecutive. Okay, so now that's our basic definitions for our trapezoids and our kites. Let's see if we can take a look at a couple of extra theorems. So um, let's see if we can talk. Um, isosceles trapezoids are the most popular one because they are so strict and they have a lot of extra kind of bonus details. So we'll spend most of our time talking about those. Uh, so to begin with, um, isosceles trapezoid base angles theorem. And this states that if you have a trapezoid and inside isosceles, then the base angles are going to be congruent. So um, a lot of times people are gonna assume, okay, so the base is here at the bottom and they notice that this angle looks a lot like this one, which is absolutely true. Now remember that you also have a base up here at the top as well. And so these angles that are attached to this base are also going to be congruent as well. So you've got lots of congruent angles. Next, the converse. So you can take that exact same idea and work it backwards. So if you notice that you've got a, trap, a, a, a trapezoid with these congruent angles down here, then that means that it's got to be isosceles. So you can kind of use that. Even if you don't know the side lengths are matching, if the base angles are matching, then that means the side lengths have to match. So what you can do is you can kind of go from the side lengths to the angles, or you can go from the angles to the side lengths. It's Going to work both ways. Next, let's talk about diagonals. So for our isosceles trapezoid, again, the diagonals are congruent. This is exactly what we had with rectangles. So uh, if I wanted to talk about this, I might be best off by naming this trapezoid or this isosceles trapezoid, I should say. And then I can talk about how one of my diagonals, which I could call now AC, and my other diagonal BD, and these guys are going to be congruent to each other. It's hard to mark this. It's really hard to mark this. And I can't do the same trick that we've done last time with the rectangles by putting a single tick mark and a single tick mark and a single one and a single one here. It's not gonna work out. So uh, our best bet is to label it over here instead. Next, mid-segment. Mid-segment is something that we had talked about with triangles before, and that is when you connected one midpoint to another midpoint. And basically what we have right here is a triangle with the top, uh, snipped off. These lines should come together a little bit closer together and intersect up here, but they didn't. And uh, we've got this kind of stubby top uh, here, which is going to make this a uh, trapezoid. So this is the trapezoid that we're looking at. We're looking at A, B, C, D. Now, if you do find the midpoints that we have like over here at point M and point M, and you connect them together, then that mid segment right there is going to have a length. Uh, and that length would be MN. Now the deal here for this length 
is that this length would be equal to the sum of the other two parallel sides, which would be AB and DC, but you have to cut that in half. And basically what we're talking about here is we're talking about taking the average of these. So this one's too short, that one's too long, it's very Goldilocks, and so we want the one that's just right, so right in the middle. So you're gonna add up the too short and the too long, and then you'll cut it in half. All right, how about kite? So for our kite right down here, we've got a kite diagonals theorem, and it just states the same thing that we saw with our rhombus, which is that our uh, diagonals are perpendicular, so we can put our 90 degree angle in there. And the other thing we can talk about is kite opposite angles theorem. And this is similar to what we had seen with the parallelogram that opposite angles are gonna be congruent, but this is very, very particular. So it says, if a quadrilateral is a kite, then exactly one pair of opposite angles is congruent, just one. So this isn't like a free for all. You could definitely see that this angle right here and it's opposite are definitely not the same size. This one's very small, that one's a bit bigger. But this angle right here and this angle right here, those match. And I want you to notice where they're formed. These angles are formed by the non-congruent side. So this side is the long one and the short one and another long one and a short one. So it's not the angles formed by two shorts or by two, two longs. All right, great. So now we have a little bit more information. Let's see if we can try out some of this stuff. So to begin with, let's take a look at this guy right here. It says, use slope to show that our shape CDEF is a trapezoid. Now remember the main thing that you need for a trapezoid is exactly one pair of parallel sides. Um, so that's an important piece. You're looking for slopes that are the same because they're gonna be parallel, but you also wanna make sure that you don't find too many parallel sides. If there's too many parallel sides, that would be bad as well. So if you take a look right here, I've got it set up so I can find four slopes. You are gonna need all four of them. There are no shortcuts. You need to show that some of them match and you also need to show that some of them do not match. So we're gonna go through that. When you're calculating slope, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. I'm gonna focus on the idea that slope is equal to rise over run. So I'm gonna start here at point C and I'm gonna rise and run till I get to point D. And so that is gonna be one, two, three units up and one unit over. And I don't need to reduce that or anything, it's all set. Let's do DE. I'm gonna rise up one and I'm gonna run over three. So they don't match, that's good. Let's keep going. EF, so for EF, I'm gonna be going down. So I need to go down one, two units and I need to go to the right two units as well. That's gonna be a slope of negative two over two. And that can reduce, that's our first one that can reduce and it's gonna to reduce to negative one. Once again, none of these match and that's actually good news. We need to see a lot of that. All right, now we do need some matches though. So fingers crossed our last one is gonna match up with something that we have here. So FC. FC is our last piece right here. You can go from C to F or from F to C. It's your choice. I'm going to choose to go from C to F. So that means I'm going to rise up two units and I'm going to run over one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is a uh, slope of two over six. And if I reduce that, that is going to reduce down to one over three. Okay, so let's take a look at the good news. So the good news is that I have two slopes that match exactly, which is super, super important. Those slopes are the same. And that means we have parallel lines. So that means DE is parallel to FC. And we can mark that on our drawing if we would like, which is great. Now, the other just as important fact is that our second set of slopes that we have here and here, it's critical that these don't match. And they certainly don't. So they're not even close. Um, and so that is very important. Uh, because a trapezoid cannot have any more than one set of parallel sides. So it's got to be limited to just one set. And we can see that right here, which means that we definitely do have ourselves a trapezoid. Okay, you try a problem. So our you try a problem right here is we're going to suppose that E is now located at the location 7, 5. So that means that we're going to change the location of E. It's not going to live there anymore. It's now going to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's going to be right over here. This is the new location for point E right there. And we're going to see if um, we can figure out uh, what type of quadrilateral CDEF is going to be. Once again, slope is going to be the main thing. You have a couple of slopes all right here that are going to work out just fine, um, like CD. That doesn't really involve point E, so that one can stay exactly how it is. Um, and you also have FC, and that one can stay exactly how it was as well. Uh, but you have two that do involve uh, point E, which is going to be DE. 
and EF. And so you're going to need to recalculate those slopes. So let's take a look at those and find out what we got. Pause the video now and give it a shot. For those new slopes, what we have right here is we have DE, which is going to now have a slope of one third and EF is now going to have a slope of three over one. So now if you take a look, our DE slope of one third is going to match up with our FC slope, which is one third as well. And so DE and FC are going to be parallel. EF is now going to have a slope of three over one, and that's now going to be a match with CD. And so we have two sets of parallel sides. We have CD is parallel to EF and DE is parallel to FC. And that means that this shape is no longer a trapezoid anymore because it has too many parallel sides and it is a parallelogram. And no, it can't be both at the same time. It has to be one or the other. Let's take a look at some more. Um, our, at the top of our next page right here, we can see uh, that we have a shelf. Um, this shelf is going to be fitted into a cupboard that exists in the corner of a kitchen. And the shelf is an isosceles trapezoid. And so we're going to try to find some angle measures and the only piece of information that we have, other than your basic definition of an isosceles trapezoid, is this 50 degree angle. Okay, so now one of the great things is that the base angles for an isosceles trapezoid match. So that means this base angle right here is going to match with this base angle right here. So if we already know that angle K is 50, that means angle N is also going to be 50 degrees. I really like those types of problems. They're really satisfying for me. Angle L. Angle L is definitely a larger obtuse angle. It is another base angle, so it should match with angle M. And so if we can find one of those, we'll basically have both of them, but we do need to find it. Okay, so now here's the deal. Um, a couple ways to look at this. One way to think about this is that you have four angles and all of those angles need to add up to 360. So that would be a 50 degree angle here, a 50 degree angle here, and two mystery angles that add up to 360. You can also cut that down um, that means that two of these angles, these two different uh, angles, need to add up to 180. That is also definitely true. That's not true because of the parallelogram supplement uh, supplementary uh, consecutive angles theorem, um, because this is not a parallelogram, but that is true because of the fact that it's a four-sided shape and all those angles need to add up to 360. So um, you get to pick. I am going to go with the the 180. So I know that this angle and this angle need to add up to 180 because the whole thing needs to add up to 360. So if I take my 180 and I subtract the 50 degree angle from it, that's going to give me my top angle, angle L, which is going to be 130 degrees. Excellent. Now the same thing is going to be true for M because once again, base angles theorem. So that's going to be another 130 degrees. And if you just want to verify that what you've done is correct, you can take all four angles and add them up. So that would be a couple of 50s and a couple of 130s. 130 and 130 is going to be 260 right off the bat. And then 50 plus 50 is another 100, which means we're up to 360. So that's definitely a good answer right there. Next one, I really like this question as well. Um, this is a, the mid-segment question. Um, this is probably gonna be the most intense math that we've done for our, uh, today's lesson. Um, this is asking for the, the length of the mid-segment. Find MN right here with no markings over the top means length. And once again, our mid-segment is gonna connect from one midpoint to the other. And it's we're looking for a medium good length. So this nine inches that we have down here is too short and the 16 is too long. And so what we need to do is we're gonna take our two short nine and our two long 16, add them up. And then we're gonna average them by dividing by two or by cutting them in half. So when we take that uh, calculation right there, we're gonna get a value that's a little bit smaller than 16, a little bit bigger than nine, about halfway between those two. And that means that our MN value right there is going to be at 12.5. And we do have a unit on here and that's gonna be inches. Next example, this one is gonna say use slope again. So we're gonna be using slope and we're gonna use it on a kite A, B, C, D. I've already plotted my four points A, B, C, D on my drawing and it definitely looks like a kite. And the job that we're supposed to do is we're supposed to show that the diagonals are perpendicular. And so slope is going to help us with that. We're not looking for matching slopes. We're looking for dramatically different slopes. Now, my um, two diagonals, one is AC and the other one is BD. And so I want to see if I can calculate those slopes. So we're going to start off with AC. So um, my C point right here is going to be 4, 8. And my A point is 0, 0. That's really easy to work with. Remember, it's rise over run, so we're going to do our y values on top and our x values on bottom. 
and I can reduce that fraction because four is a good common factor. We wanna do the exact same kind of work for our second diagonal, which is BD. Now um, D right here has got the 0.5 comma five and B has got the 0.7 comma one. We're gonna start with our Y values. So it's gonna be five minus one. And then we're gonna do our X values, which is gonna be another five and we're gonna subtract seven this time. I'm gonna reduce that fraction as well. And that's gonna reduce down to negative two over one, or if you'd like, just negative two. Okay, so now what did we find? We certainly didn't find matching slopes. That's good though. Um, what I do notice is that this slope right here has a one on top, while this slope has a one on bottom. This slope's got a two on bottom. This one's got a two on top. This slope is positive and this slope is negative. These slopes that we have right here are opposite reciprocals. And that's perfect because that means that AC is going to be perpendicular to BD because the slopes are opposite reciprocals. The signs need to be different and the fractions need to be upside down from each other. All right, your next one is you try a problem and you're gonna be trying to find the measure of angle T. One of the major things to remember about this is that a kite like this is gonna have two matching angles and T happens to be one of those. T and R are gonna have the exact same measure. The other important thing is the one that we had talked about already is that all four angles need to add up to 360. So that means that if we start off with our 360 and we subtract our 70 and our 88, well, that's gonna give us 202. Now this angle is definitely not a 202 degree angle, that's too big. But what's happening here is that the 202 that we just came up with is gonna be evenly split between these two congruent angles. So then I'm gonna take that 202, divide it so that it's split nicely and that's gonna give me my angle measure of 101. All right, last set. So for our last set, we're gonna have some similar problems that we've seen before, which is gonna be the always, sometimes, and never problems. These are very, very popular in our quadrilateral unit. Um, so for our first one, it says diagonals of a trapezoid are congruent. Okay, so we need to uh, remember that our trapezoids can look a couple of different ways. Um, and so uh, for our diagonals, for our trapezoid, they can sometimes be congruent, specifically if the trapezoid is an isosceles trapezoid. But if it's a, a different type of trapezoid, then those diagonals are not gonna match at all. So this is just a sometimes case, and it's for a very specific type of trapezoid. Next, opposite sides of a rectangle are congruent. Opposite sides for a rectangle are gonna be congruent. And uh, that is going to be true, not so much because it is a rectangle, but because our, all rectangles are parallelograms and our parallelogram opposite uh, sides theorem is gonna state that those sides are gonna be congruent. Next, a square is a rectangle. The major definition for a rectangle is that it has 90 degree angles, specifically four of them, and squares have that as well. So this is always gonna be the case. I bring this up for a couple of reasons, mainly because there is a misconception floating around that rectangles specifically need to have two unique sets of congruent sides, and that's not true. It just needs to have four 90 degree angles. Next, a square is not a rhombus. And um, this one is never true. So part of being a square is the 90 degree angles we already talked about. But the other part about being a square is that it has congruent sides. And that's what a rhombus has as well. A square is both a rhombus and a rectangle at the exact same time. Next, um, all angles of a parallelogram are congruent. That is sometimes true, specifically for rectangles and for squares, but not always. Opposite angles of an isosceles trapezoid are congruent. No, that's not true. Um, consecutive base angles are. Those ones are the ones that can be congruent, but not opposite angles. So that one is going to be a never. And then lastly, the diagonals of a parallelogram are perpendicular. Well, for a regular parallelogram, maybe not so much, but for a rhombus, uh, they would be. And so it is possible that they can be perpendicular to each other, but it doesn't always occur. It just sometimes occurs. And the same would be true for a square as well. Okay, there you go. That covers all of the quadrilaterals that we're gonna be talking about. That's parallelogram, rhombus square, rectangle, and now trapezoid, isosceles, trapezoid, and kites.